I'm Brandon, and this is Video Game History, a show where I look back on certain franchises of video games and retrospectively review them. To kick things off, I'll be taking a look at Cartoon Network's extensive catalogue of video games that spans the past 16 years. Today we go back to November 14, 2000, to the very first game released based on a Cartoon Network show, Dexter's Laboratory Robot Rampage, for the Game Boy Color. Well, actually, according to Wikipedia, both this and the Powerpuff Girls Bad Mojo Jojo released on the same day in North America, which must have been a hallmark day for Cartoon Network fans, but I've decided to review this one first. So let's have a look at the background surrounding this release. Robot Rampage was developed by Altron and published by BAM Entertainment on November 14, 2000, as I mentioned. However, calling it the first Cartoon Network game is a little bit dubious. You see, Dexter's Laboratory Robot Rampage is actually a reskin of Altron's game Elevator Action EX, which was released on the Game Boy Color less than two months earlier. From what I can gather, Elevator Action EX was only released in Europe and Japan. They then decided to give it a Dexter's Laboratory skin to sell it in North America. Unfortunately, there is very little information about this scenario that exists on the internet, so I'm going to assume what I've pieced together is true. Now when I say reskin, I mean reskin. This game is literally identical to Elevator Action EX, right down to having three playable characters while unlocking a boss character to play as upon completion of the game. And judging by the two surviving reviews of the game, or perhaps the only two reviews this game ever got, it actually seems like this game might be quite good. IGN gave it a 7 out of 10, while similarly, GameSpot gave it a 6.9 out of 10. But rather than take their word for it, I'm going to dive in myself. As I alluded to earlier, you have three characters to choose from. Regular Dexter, Dexter in RoboSuit 1, or Dexter in RoboSuit 2. RoboSuit 1 starts you off with 5 hearts of health, but makes you move more slowly, while RoboSuit 2 starts you with only 3 hearts of health, but allows you to jump further and move quicker. As you may have guessed, regular Dexter is the all-rounder character and has 4 hearts of health upon starting the game. While the different suits is kinda neat, I can't help but thinking adding proper different characters instead of robot suits would have been much cooler. Would it have really been so hard to add in DD or Monkey? I also find it funny that DD appears on the cover, despite never making an appearance in the game, only being referenced once by Mandark in the beginning. In fact, the whole cover is misleading. Dexter never gets to control a cool mech. This cover tells you nothing about what this game is, other than it's based on Dexter's laboratory. Moving on to the actual game, the story starts off with Mandark taking over Dexter's robots and setting them loose in his lab, and now it's up to Dexter to take it back. All of this story information is accompanied by a horrific text scrolling sound that sounds like a machine gun firing off. After playing the game for less than 30 seconds, it's very clear that this is an elevator action game. You travel up and down elevators, shooting enemies, and collecting the allotted amount of secret codes for each level. Getting stuck or needing to find the last code could have been a nightmare in this game, as some of the levels are rather large, however there exists a nice mechanic that activates upon you reaching the end of the level. If you don't have all of the codes, it will transport you back to the location you need to go to, which saves a lot of annoying backtracking. The game's controls are simple, using the A button to jump, or B button shoots. Your jump will come in very handy during the game, as you can leap over bullets and jump across gaps without having to wait for an elevator. Some enemies can even be killed by jumping on their head Mario style, which is something I didn't discover until later in the game, but it definitely came in handy once I did figure it out. Down button allows you to duck, which assists in dodging enemy fire, while the up and down buttons control the elevators once you're inside of them. Going in red doors can change a weapon into a more powerful ray gun or grenades, or you can increase your health or score, which can be used to give yourself extra lives. There's a bit of risk involved here, however, as you often have to make the decision between whether you want to ensure you keep the weapon you have, or refill your health. One huge downside of this is that if you get the grenades, you are screwed. They are by far the worst weapons in the game, and you're good as dead if you end up with them. I was also incredibly confused how to use the red doors at first. It seemed like I was just randomly getting pulled into them and that none of the buttons would let me enter. This problem stems from the game just dropping you in and giving you literally no instructions on how the mechanics work. Luckily for me I've played elevator action before, but for someone new they'd be even more lost than I was. I also had no idea what my objective was. Eventually I figured it out and I felt like an idiot. 
By standing on the white lines next to the red doors, you're able to enter them. And upon entering one of these doors containing a secret code, I figured out that I would need to be collecting all of them to advance. So that explains why there is a counter at the top of the screen. By foregoing a button prompt to enter the doors, the game creates a problem where you're sometimes forced to go into doors that you really don't want to. Too many times I ended up with the grenades or found myself surrounded by enemies because I was made to enter a door when I didn't want to. The game consists of four stages, each containing four scenes, which is just a fancy way of saying four levels. The final scene of every level requires you to defeat a bunch of enemies in a small hallway. These endings to stages are extremely anticlimactic, particularly because the combat is not where this game shines. Enemies also vary from level to level, with robot dogs and small Roomba looking robots that take multiple hits to kill being added alongside the regular robots as you progress. One thing I enjoyed a lot about the enemies is that they travelled around the level quite intelligently. Rather than just staying on the floor that they're spawned on, they'll take escalators and elevators just like you do. You could also consider elevators and elevator shafts to be a sort of enemy. As you move about levels, you need to be constantly aware of being crushed by rising or falling elevators, and if you fall more than one level down an elevator shaft, you're met with an instant death. Fortunately, death isn't a huge setback as there is a great checkpoint system in place. Usually in a game like this, death would make you start from scratch, however that is not the case here. Unfortunately, a lot of my deaths came in a very specific, cheap way. Most of the times I'd take damage were when I'd be coming out of a door, which feels incredibly cheap. This becomes far more frustrating in later levels, where the game throws a greater number of enemies at you. At times I would enter a door and have three robots shooting at me as I came out, with a robot dog running across the ground for good measure, making it next to impossible to not take at least one hit. Every now and then an occasional wrinkle is thrown into the gameplay like weak floors you can fall through and sensor alarms you can trip. The breakable floors force you to utilise Dexter's jump ability and makes you focus on your surroundings. I think they missed a big opportunity here though. The robots don't fall through these floors when stepped on, which would have added an extra layer of strategy if you were able to lure the robots into these traps. For the most part the game is pretty easy. That is until you reach the last stage. The robot dogs will fuck you up, and you basically need to utilise every single one of your lives to beat each scene in the final stage. Seriously, half the time you cannot do anything to avoid taking hits due to the increased amount of enemies and the door problem I mentioned earlier. The very final scene of the game has you finally encountering Mandark. Well, sort of. You actually face off against Mandark's super robot, which is far better when compared to the ending of the previous three stages. Though, once you know what you're doing in the boss battle, it becomes super easy to win. Upon defeating the super robot, you get to kick Mandark out of your lab, and you unlock the super robot to use in the game. Super Robot is a combination of the two Robo Suits. It gives you the 5 hearts of health you get with the first Robo Suit, but you still maintain all of the speed and agility of the second Robo Suit, making the Super Robot by far the best character. So what's my verdict on Dexter's Laboratory Robot Rampage? It's okay. It's fun for the most part, but there are some definite flaws that are incredibly obvious and bring down your enjoyment significantly. I just can't help but think about the potential this game could have had if it wasn't just a reskin. If Ultron were going to delay the release of Elevator Action EX in North America for two months, surely they could have worked on altering a few things that would have made Robot Rampage so much better. The game is only about two and a half hours long, so if the only adjustment was making the game longer instead of the exact same length, the game would have benefited greatly. Instead, it's just the same as Elevator Action EX and can barely be considered a Dexter's Lab game. I think the idea of inserting something like Dexter's Lab into an already pre-existing game is really cool but not changing anything other than the skin of the game is extremely lazy and actually kind of upsetting considering this was Dexter and Cartoon Network's video game debut. In this day and age, something like this would have been a nifty little $5-$10 DLC pack for Elevator Action EX, rather than a full-blown release as its own game. Overall, I would still recommend you play it though, as it's nowhere near awful and it won't take up too much of your time. There's definitely something here for both Dexter's Lab and video game fans alike to enjoy. Today we're reviewing Dexter's Laboratory Disaster Strikes, the first card and network game for the Game Boy Advance. It was released in North America on September 26, 2001 and November 2 in PAL regions, 
and it was the second Dexas Laboratory game to be made. Disaster Strikers is actually one of the higher rated Cartoon Network games, sitting at a 65 on Metacritic, receiving an 8 out of 10 from Nintendo Power, a 7 out of 10 from Yahoo, and a 65 from IGN. However, it also received a couple of 2s and 3s, so I went into this game cautious, particularly after the trio of Powerpuff Girls games I had to endure. Immediately upon booting up the game, you find yourself watching quite a cool intro cutscene, so things are off to the right start. You also notice straight away that the game looks quite good, and the music is nice. Disaster Strikes is definitely the best looking and sounding Cartoon Network game I've played so far. They're certainly taking advantage of the Game Boy Advance. After playing for about 30 seconds, it becomes incredibly obvious that this is just an Ape Escape clone with a Dexter's Lab skin. DD has gotten into Dexter's laboratory and managed to create hundreds of mini clones of herself, so it's up to Dexter to round them all up. I highly recommend that you play the tutorial instead of just jumping in headfirst. Otherwise you'll be incredibly confused, not knowing what to do, and it's unlikely you'll be able to progress far. Honestly, they should have made the tutorial mandatory. The game controls rather simply, with A controlling your jump, R is used to punch, L toggles your equipped item, and B allows you to use your item. Dexter is controlled with the D-pad, however, due to the game using a 3D environment, he becomes tough to control, making the platforming segments much trickier than they're intended to be. You'll find many unique weapons and items for use around levels, and these will often be crucial in solving puzzles and removing roadblocks. All the different weapons manage to capture the spirit of the show perfectly. Unfortunately, the vast majority of enemies can't be killed. Instead, they simply collapse for a few seconds and then get right up again. This becomes tedious and is really a waste of the unique weapons. Like the Ape Escape games, you have a hub world that allows you to travel to other levels. Unlike the Ape Escape games though, this hub world can be kind of confusing, and the map that they give you to track what levels you've been to really doesn't make anything clearer. In these levels, you'll mainly be fixing machines to access new areas so you can grab all of the mini DDs and return them. There are 70 levels spread across 8 unique worlds, each one feeling different enough from the last despite all being located inside of Dexter's lab. That's about as much positivity I can produce about this game, because the rest of my experience with Disaster Strikes was filled with glitches and shocking game design. Firstly, when you lose all of your lives, it simply reloads your last save, meaning you start with the same amount of lives you had then, rather than doing something like, say, a 2D Mario, where if you lose all your lives during a world, you're sent back to the very start, but you still begin with the default amount of lives. If you don't know this and accidentally save your game with only one life left, progressing becomes insanely hard. Eventually I had to resort to using an infinite lives cheat, because 1-ups were so rare, and if I didn't add any extra lives, I was never going to be able to progress. The very first time the game glitched on me, it wouldn't allow me to shoot, despite saying I had 40 bullets left. Okay, that's a minor annoyance, I'll let it slide. The game then glitched me through an electrified barrier. This meant I couldn't progress, as I didn't have the required items to continue going forward, and it was impossible for me to get back through the barrier, no matter how hard I tried. Then the game decided it wanted to glitch the items you pick up, failing to register that I had picked up a keycard. Because this keycard completely disappeared, but didn't go into my inventory, I was unable to progress, yet again. Finally, the game decided it was just flat out not going to let my character move. This was the last straw for me. I just couldn't take it anymore. I'd lost my progress thanks to glitches three times now. One time is too many, but three fucking times? That is unacceptable. There was no way I was going to continue persisting with such a broken, bland, and repetitive game and attempt to complete it. Dexter's Laboratory Disaster Strikes is awful and somehow manages to come close to the trio of Game Boy Powerpuff Girl games. I really didn't think that was possible. I must have been playing a completely different game to the review outlets that scored this game positively, because the game that I played was a complete mess. It's just a poor man's ape escape, featuring some of the worst platforming you'll ever see. Without all the glitches, I probably could have wheeled myself on and completed the game, because while it's incredibly boring and repetitive, the gameplay isn't completely terrible. However, when your game glitches out once every hour or so, causing me to lose significant progress, there's no way possible that I can find the motivation to play it to the end. As I stated in my Dexter's Laboratory Robot Rampage review, I don't mind the idea of taking established games and putting a Cartoon Network show skin on it, but when you do such a poor job of emulating the original, you might just be better off trying to create a completely original game. I don't even know why they thought it would be a good idea to make a Dexter's Laboratory Ape Escape style game for the Game Boy Advance, 
when a huge part of the Ape Escape games is that it's completely 3D. I bet if you all of a sudden made an Ape Escape game that forces you to move in a rigid grid, it would suck. I can only hope that future Dexter's Lab games have some originality about them. Released on March 2, 2002 in North America and April 12 in Europe, Dexter's Laboratory Mandux Lab is the first and only Dexter's Lab game on home consoles, being exclusive to the PlayStation 1. The PlayStation 2 came out at the end of 2000, so this game was a very late PS1 game. This also makes it the only Dexter's Lab game not to be on a Nintendo console. This exclusive title was developed by Red Lemon Studios. Founded in Scotland way back in 1996, Red Lemon was built up by three ex-Gremlin Interactive devs. In 1998, they would partner with Sega to develop games for the Dreamcast, and in 1999, they would release their very first game. This was a tie-in to Braveheart, which was extremely timely and relevant, seeing as the film had only been released for three whole years at that point. That they may take our lives! But they'll never take our freedom! After that stellar debut, they'd release a couple more games before winding up working on Dexter's Lab. Finally, they'd release Farscape the game later that same year before going bankrupt in 2003. A wild bit of trivia is that Mandux Lab was first shown to the public at E3. This has actually happened a few times over Cartoon Network's history. God do I miss the days when a Cartoon Network game would legitimately be announced at E3. Such simpler and quainter times. The reception for Mandux Lab seems to have been mixed, but for a Cartoon Network game, especially in this era, that's actually a positive. Sitting on a 62 meta score, its most positive review was from the official US PlayStation magazine who gave it a 7, while the lowest score was a 5.2. A 7 out of 10 from something like official PlayStation Mag is pretty promising for a game like this. Because of how old this game is, I couldn't find too many reviews, but I did find this sterling user review from the legend that is Christian E. Okay, I guess. 9 out of 10. Godspeed, you chaotic motherfucker. The critical reception seems kind of promising, and you guys have been falling over yourselves for three years to let me know that I haven't reviewed this game yet. The Mandark Slab comments are only second to the Teen Titans comments that I get on every single video. If this game is god awful, I'm blaming each and every one of you. But now, on with the review. Denied entry into my own laboratory? This cannot be! Mandux Lab sets out to blow you away with its first impression. Upon starting up the story mode, you're immediately hit with a staggeringly high quality cutscene. This is a pretty extensive bit of original animation. Well, at least I'm pretty sure it's original animation, I couldn't find any episodes that seem to match the plot of these cutscenes. This is unique in that most Cartoon Network games either have 3D in-engine cutscenes, or have a very basic and cheap looking form of 2D animation that sort of mimics the show's style. Instead, we have multiple cutscenes throughout the game that were clearly done by the same people in charge of the show. I'm loving this already. Powerpuff Girls Relish Rampage, which was on the next generation of consoles, didn't even have this. It also feels like this game has enough story content to fill out an entire Dexter's Lab episode. While the story was playing out, I got the vibe that this was a story that came straight out of the writer's room. Essentially, Mandark sneaks into Dexter's Lab and completely takes it over, locking Dexter out entirely in the process. It's your job to find a way back into the lab and then regain control from Dexter's arch nemesis. After being blown away by the TV quality animation, the next thing I was blown away by was the in-game graphics. Well, blown away is a massive exaggeration on my part, but I was impressed. I have the game running up res to 1080p textures, but even on the base setting, it's very respectable. This game takes place in Dexter's house and lab, and while it's not the biggest environment in terms of scope, I was definitely satisfied with what I was seeing. Characters also looked really natural in their 3D models. So the game kicks off and you naturally start exploring Dexter's house. Later on, you'll be doing the same thing in the lab. I always love stuff like this. Any game that gives you the chance to explore iconic locations in 3D just always massively appealed to me. Whether it's this, The Simpsons House and Springfield in Hit and Run, or Retroville in the Jimmy Neutron game, a quick way to winning me over is by doing some form of this. The soundtrack for Mandux Lab slaps too. Seriously, listen to some of these tracks. There was no need for the soundtrack to go this hard in a throwaway Dexter's Lab game on the PS1 two years after the PS2 released, but I appreciate it so much. The 
The one annoyance I had with the presentation and overall environment exploration was the grating sound made every time Dexter walks. This is too easy. It's unbelievably annoying, just an absolute assault on your ears. The final thing I should mention about the presentation is that Mandark's lab is fully voice acted. No, it's not just voice acted in the 2D cutscenes or major story moments. Every single line of dialogue in this game is voice acted. If I remember correctly, I was the best dodgeball player in school, although I did have some high tech help. This seems like a no brainer, but so many licensed games skimp out on this. Samurai Jack Battle Through Time came out a couple of weeks ago and that didn't even have voice acting outside of cutscenes. It's almost nothing but positives at the moment, but what the heck are we actually doing in this game? Well, Mandark's Lab is a mini game collection. Camp Laszlo Leaky Lake Games and that Johnny Bravo game with the ridiculously long name had the same sort of idea and they were both train wrecks. Here we'll have to play through seven unique mini games to try and thwart Mandark's evil plans. First up is a dance off with Dee Dee. This is a pretty standard rhythm game. If you've ever seen DDR, Parappa the Rapper, or Jungle Book Groove Party, you'll be familiar with what's happening here. My personal favourite obscure game in this genre was the American Idol PS2 game. Like a virgin. With little work you could be average, but nothing better. Button prompts will fly onto screen and it's up to you to press them as they enter the circle in the middle at the right time. A running theme through a lot of the mini games here are that they have multiple rounds, with the goal being to reach a specific score to qualify for the next round. The more in time your button presses are, the more points you gain. As you go through the rounds here, the button combinations and speed get a little more difficult, but Red Lemon deliberately prevents it from ever getting genuinely hard or challenging. Firstly, these random screen clearing rockets would shoot off periodically, and I have no idea what was activating them. I wasn't pressing anything other than the button prompts flying onto screen, so I think the game was just doing this automatically. This minigame also massively scales the difficulty to how you're performing. If you mess up, the game slows everything down to the point where it becomes insultingly easy. It's impossible to fail this unintentionally. The final stage of this game is actually quite fast paced, but it feels like as soon as you miss one press, the game slows down and goes into baby mode. I would have enjoyed this way more if I was allowed to be challenged. And overall, there's no difficulty option in this game. This is begging out for a sliding scale of challenge, but instead you're stuck on a difficulty level that was obviously tuned for children. The only other notable thing here is that Dexter's mech suit finally makes its debut after being teased on Robot Rampage's cover. The second mini game you'll play is Cootie Call. Here you're tasked with destroying cooties by spraying them. It's an on-rails shooter that's very basic, but kind of fun I guess. You'll spray the germs with X, while you also have screen clearing bombs that can be activated with Square. Both of these attacks are limited in their use. The regular spray has a meter that drains every time you use it, but it's refilled via a minigame in between rounds. It's a minigame inside of a minigame, minigameception. The screen clearing move on the other hand is limited to just three uses total. Like I said, it's very basic, offers a bit of fun, but there's not much to talk about. I did find it funny that the music sort of just ran out during this though. I was sitting there in silence for a bit before the game booted the track up again. Once you destroy the disgusting cooties that live within the depths of DD's room, you regain access to Dexter's lab and can start exploring it. Uh -oh, Dex is in the, lab again. the third mini game I participated in was Up and Adam. Up and Adam. Here you jump in a ship and shoot down rogue atoms to collect their cores. It's a ship shooter that, like pretty much everything else we're going to see here, is basic. X or triangle is used to thrust, square and circle fire your weapon, and R1 or R1 are used to perform a stun attack. This is easily the worst minigame so far. The other two hadn't been stellar or anything, but this one was just so boring and provided even less challenge. Continuing the theme of every game having one weird quirk, the draw distance here is laughably small. It was so bad that it actually had a slight impact on finding the atoms, but it's so easy that it never hinders you too much. Much more enjoyable is What's Bug in Dexter. This game is an obstacle course where Dexter needs to chase down and swat a bug five times. You'll hold down X or triangle to run, square and circle will jump, and L1 or R1 will swat. While I did enjoy this, the camera angle Red Lemon chose is god awful. Why did they think this was acceptable? Once I sort of adjusted to this painful view, I had some fun, but the game is over as quickly as it starts. Unlike every other minigame so far, this one has just one round. As soon as you swap the bug five times, it ends. The track you run around is also quite short. If more content and time had been put into this, I would have been extremely satisfied. So you've completed another two mini games and we get some more story. 
This time it results in Dexter being turned into Old Man Dexter, complete with brand new model. I'd be lying if I said I didn't bust out a massive grin when seeing this happen. Seeing old Dexter hobble around was great. The next two mini games were all about Dexter's memories, and actually recreate episodes from the show. First, in Soapbox Derby, he remembers the time he raced against the mysterious driver D, which is a reference to the episode Mach 5. This is a kart racer, making this like the fifth time we've seen kart racing in Cartoon Network video game history. Controls are pretty standard, but where this is different is that you have a constantly recharging speed boost. There are no limits to how many times you can use this speed boost, with a very minor cooldown being the one thing preventing you from using it 100% of the time. That doesn't stop you from spamming it though. Doing this makes the whole mini game pointless. I never even saw my opponent during any of the three races you do, except for the moments where I overlap them. You also really only get two unique tracks despite doing three races. Yeah, the third track is slightly different to the first, but for all intents and purposes, they're the same except for the final bit at the end. And again, why have Red Lemon chosen this absurd angle? It is not fun to race like this. This could have been a really enjoyable experience. Heck, it's chronologically the first time kart racing combined with Cartoon Network. But it's so half-baked and filled with poor design choices that it's absolutely terrible. Still probably slightly better than Ben 10 Galactic Racing though. My main takeaway from this was that we totally should have got a proper Cartoon Network kart racer in this era the same way Nickelodeon did. The next memory-based minigame is Dexter Dodgeball, which is based on the Season 1 episode of the same name. This is another on-rails shooter with just a couple of unique distinctions compared to Cootie Call. This time ammo is unlimited and your enemies fight back by throwing dodgeballs at you. This doesn't actually affect you, you don't have a health bar or anything, but I guess it's a slight distraction. I probably would have found this game fine if Cootie Call wasn't already used. The rounds here are also way longer, which doesn't help at all. I think the best thing it has to offer is the smashable windows. I easily flew past the qualifying points total each time, so at the end of every round, I just smash windows for fun. And am I the only one that thought this enemy looked like the long lost younger brother of Eddie from Ed Ed and Eddie? After reliving those memories, Dexter changes back into his regular self, and it's time to square off against Mandark, who reveals he's rigged a bomb to explode. He's not blowing up Dexter's lab, no. Instead, he's blowing up a fish tank that will then soak the lab. Talk about an unnecessarily convoluted plan. The seventh minigame you play is just a rehash of the very first. Titled Molecular Mix-Off, it's just a dance minigame with a chemistry aesthetic. The game is significantly more challenging this time around, with buttons flying from all corners of the screen instead of raining down from the top, but the exact same difficulty mechanic is employed here. I really wish this game had difficulty settings. The eighth and final game is Sub-Zero Soccer. Remember the ice hockey minigame in Spyro 2? This is exactly that. Your goal is to score 5 goals against Mandark, utilizing power-ups from the racing section to spice it up a little. This was genuinely fun, and while an ice hockey game is a kind of anticlimactic way to end things, I had the most fun right here. Once you slap in your 5th goal, Mandark admits defeat, and the game ends. Total runtime of 60 to 90 minutes. Gaming back in the day was brutal. Imagine as a kid getting your one sporadic game from your parents, and you beat it in a single sitting. There isn't a whole lot of extra content outside of the main story and its minigames either. The game has one type of collectible. In each area of the game you'll find four pieces of a blueprint. Once you gather them all, you're taken to a rotating puzzle that actually is pretty challenging, especially compared to the standard gameplay. There's no visual indication that these blueprint pieces are on the ground, so finding them is basically luck. But because the environments are so small, it's actually pretty easy. When you complete these puzzles, you unlock a bunch of really cool concept art in Dexter's vault. There's even a cool drawing of Gendy Tartakovsky. Oh hell yeah, I unlocked the Glizzy Gobbler 3000. As you'd probably expect, there's also a mode where you can replay each minigame, even allowing a second player to jump in too. But outside of that, there's not much to do once your 90 minute playthrough is over. territory will be submerged under a sea of salty water. Well, Mandark's lab was definitely better than Johnny Bravo and Camp Laszlo. Honestly, overall, I enjoyed my time with Mandark's lab. It is massively flawed, with basically every single minigame featuring one major design issue, but even with all of that, I still walked away feeling positive. When you compare it to the stuff we see today, Dexter's Laboratory Mandark's lab doesn't seem special, but in the context of when it was released, it truly is. To this point in time, we had never seen this kind of production quality from a Cartoon Network game. 
the full voice acting and iconic environments from the show were a dream come true for fans. In its current state, the game needed a few tweaks to really reach its full potential. Personally, seeing as this game came out in 2002, I think it was a mistake to not take advantage of the PS2. Harnessing the extra power of that console could have allowed them to do so much. Not only would it look better, but they could have had more intricate minigames and even more environments to explore. Imagine if we got to go around Dexter's school or Mandark's lab, or even interact with the Justice friends, Agent Honeydew and Monkey. There's a lot of missed potential, but I can confidently say this is the best Dexter's lab game ever released. So, Dexter's Laboratory Chess Challenge is literally just a chess game. It's based on Battle Chess, which was an older series that gave animations to give chess games some more life. Since chess has a pretty rigid set of rules, you'd think this would be a super simple game to make. Yet, VirtuCraft have somehow managed to completely fuck it up. Every single video game based on a board or card game that I have played has always had an extensive tutorial that allows brand new players to become familiar. However, Chess Challenge literally just drops you in and says, hey, figure that shit out yourself. Absolutely none of the rules of this game are explained. You have four game modes to choose from. Tournament, Versus, Quick Game, and Puzzle. Notice there's no option for a tutorial or even somewhere where you can just read the rules. If you want to play this game, you better be an expert at chess already. I went into this having a minimal understanding of chess, and this game did nothing to help me improve. Even on the easiest difficulty, this game is just way too hard for a beginner to play. I tried my best to learn on the fly, but it was just too tough. Sure, I could look up the rules on Google and probably be fine, but back in the day when this game came out, there wasn't such luxuries. Now I know how movie critics and parents who were confused by the first Pokemon movie must have felt. VirtuCraft are just so confused about who their target audience is. There's nothing wrong with making a portable chess game that allows you to play chess anywhere. In fact, it's actually a rather convenient thing for diehard chess fans. But they decided to use the Dexter's Laboratory license for this game. A show aimed at an incredibly young audience who, for the most part, probably have no clue how to play. If you're going to use a cartoon license for a chess video game, you sure as hell better include a tutorial, or at least make it easier. While I am saying this game is ridiculously hard, it's important to note that I literally never lost a game while I was playing. How is this possible, you ask? Because literally every game I played ended either in a stalemate or a draw. Literally none of the games I played ended up achieving a result. How fun. You can choose to play as Dexter, DD, Mandark, or Major Glory. However, the only thing choosing your character does is change the various animations you get when you take a piece. There's an animation every time you take a piece, which is initially kind of neat, but eventually you're just slamming the A button and wanting to get on with the game. I could imagine this would be even more annoying for people who actually know how to play chess and just want to get on with it. The music during games is also just one short, infinite loop, which is grating as hell. Let's check out the one other game mode in this game, shall we? Surely puzzle mode will be better than tournament mode. Oh, how wrong I was. These so-called puzzles have the least effort I have ever seen in my entire life. You can literally just brute force your way through every single one of these puzzles. Even the puzzles that are supposed to be for experts. All of the puzzles just require you to get a checkmate in a single turn. The problem with these kind of puzzles is that there's a limited number of legal moves you can make. Meaning if you just attempt each puzzle like 10 times, you'll succeed. If you have the patience for trial and error, you could literally beat all of these puzzles in 15 minutes. Surely they could have come up with some other puzzles besides this. It's really not much of a puzzle if literally every person on earth could beat this entire thing if they tried. VirtuCraft hadn't released a game in 11 months when this came out. What the hell were they doing in that time? It would have taken no time at all to get the basic chess parts of the game working. So surely they could have used the rest of the time to give the game more content. It's just yet another attempt at a quick cash grab by using a Cartoon Network franchise. There's no other way to put it. This game is awful. What went through their minds when they made a chess game aimed at kids, but didn't want to include any kind of tutorial? If you're going to make a chess game aimed at kids, you need to teach them how to play. And honestly, how many copies do you think this game sold? 10? Sure, it has the Dexter's Lab branding, but what kid wants to play a freaking chess game? If somebody owned this game as a child or knew someone who did, please let me know. 